I'm Albert Wong. I'm the director of the center. I'm a general internist and clinical investigator here, and I want to welcome all of you. Um, so the Chronic Disease Center was established eight years ago. Our vision is to create a world where healthcare research and policy seamlessly interact to improve the health of individuals at risk for uh, or living with chronic diseases. And, um, and we host this annual symposium to bring together clinicians, researchers, and uh, policymakers so that we can have a dialogue. So I, I'm, I regret that we can't meet together. We would be having breakfast together, lunch, and we would be having more conversation over poster sessions. But uh, because of the pandemic, we've had to transform this in typical in-person symposium into a speaker series. Um, Despite the change in venue, I think that uh, you're still going to find that um, that we have a great uh, topic for this year's symposium, and our speakers are going to be as engaging as they would be in person. Uh, this year's topic, transcending boundaries, immigrant and refugee health in 2020, um, is both a timeless topic but one that seems to be uh, more salient than ever. We're living in a time in which people still seek safety an opportunity in a new country, despite the immediate and long-term physical and psychological risks. And they take on these risks, despite the political and policy landscape that is increasingly designed to make immigrants and refugees feel unwelcome. So uh, we are extremely lucky to have our first speaker to kick off this series, uh, David Marrero. Uh, for those of you who don't know David Marrero, he's a uh, David Marrero PhD, is a director of the University of Arizona's Center for Health Disparities Research. The center works to develop programs and strategies to improve health and well being along the US Mexico border and across the greater Southwest. He's a professor of multiple schools at the University of Arizona, um, including the School of Public Health, the College of Medicine. Um, he joined the University of Arizona after 33 years at, the Indi in, at Indiana University, where he was director of the Diabetes Translational Research Center, and he was J.O. Ritchie Professor of Medicine. He's basically most famous for developing uh, uh, di the Diabetes Prevention Program, the Triad Study, and working and developing novel ways of translating findings from the clinical trials on diabetes prevention into real world settings. He's won almost every major prize in diabetes that's available. He's twice won the Diabetes Education Tools Award from the American Association of Diabetes Educators. He's been um, Associate Editor of Diabetes Care, Associate Editor of Diabetes Forecast. He won the Outstanding Educator of the Year for Diabetes in 2008 from the American Diabetes Association. And he was President for Healthcare and Education of the ADA. So we're extremely lucky to have him. Um, talk about his experiences from Arizona. During the talk, please mute yourself. If you have questions, type them in the chat box and I'll review them um, after Dr. Marrero speaks. And then please um, look at the schedule of the next three speakers. Next week is going to be Alka Kanaya from UCSF. Um, the week after that will be Janine Young from University of Colorado, an expert in refugee health. And then our own Aracia Martinez Cardoso is speaking at the end of the month. Month. Just want to remind everybody in a month we're going to all have to vote. So remember to vote, and we're happy to support uh, UShi Votes, a nonpartisan group um, helping to ensure everyone on campus is registered to vote. And if you're not on campus, go to TurboVote to see how best to vote. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass this on to Dr. Marrero. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to have this opportunity to talk with all of you today. As Albert said, I spent 33 years in Indiana and retired and two weeks later found myself in Arizona trying to build a new center for border health disparities research. Uh, it was a remarkable transformation. It's a very different part of the country than I was used to. And I'm gonna share with you a little bit about some of the things I've learned and some thoughts I have about how we might progress in bringing quality health care to a very unique population. Let's see if I can get this to work today. All right, I always like to start with how serious is the problem? When we talk about diabetes, what are we talking about? And how quickly will it grow? Because as you're gonna see in a minute, it's not a stable issue. 
when we look at Hispanics in the United States, we see that there are about 58 million that were documented in 2016. That's 17% of the US population. And it's anticipated to go up to almost 29% by 2060. This is an old statistic. And in fact, if you look at more current data, it depends on who you read, but the numbers are growing very rapidly. It's the most rapidly growing minority population in the United States. And it really, uh, the principal driver of the U.S. demographic growth, it accounts for about half of the national population growth since 2000. As you can see in the, uh, the graph on the right side, from 1970 up to 2016 was a very rapid escalation. And from 2016 to 2020, that line would almost go off the screen. So it's, it's, it's quite uh, robust. And the estimates for the U.S. Census Bureau, and I'm dying to find out what we get this year. I know it's gotten uh, truncated a bit by the COVID, but they were estimating prior to uh, doing the census that by 2050, one in three people living in the United States will be of Hispanic or Latino origin, which is very significant. Now in Arizona, we have quite a few Hispanics. We are adjacent to the Mexican border. So about 31% of Arizona residents are Hispanic and 81% of them are Mexican. So because we're adjacent to the Mexican border, quite a few people have come up through Mexico. We get some Central Americans and some El Salvadorians, but it's almost exclusively Mexican origin individuals. Now, when you look at the prevalence of diabetes amongst Hispanics, it's, there's a tendency by many people to lump all Hispanics are Spanish speaking people into one category, to one group. And this is just not an effective way to consider the populations. And this slide shows the difference in percentage of, of populations that are of Hispanic heritage uh, and what their rates of diabetes are, the prevalence of diabetes. As you can see that Mexicans are at the top of the, of the hill here. And I just saw data before I submitted these slides uh, that I didn't get into these slides, that it's about 20% of, of diabetes amongst Hispanics is now Mexicans. So what are the factors that contribute to diabetes disparities amongst Hispanics? Because what you discover when you move to the Southwest is that there's a tremendous amount of health access disparities and health quality disparities reflected amongst Hispanic populations in comparison to non-Hispanic populations. And I think that this is a complex interaction between biologic, genetic, environmental, and psychosocial factors. And I'm gonna talk mostly about two of them today, and that's food insecurity and obesity. We also know that there are individual behaviors and environmental factors that contribute to this. We know that Mexican origin people tend to have higher amounts of total saturated fat, refined car uh, uh, carbohydrates, and sugar-sweetened beverages in their diet. We know that they get fewer vegetables per day in comparison to other uh, racial or ethnic groups. We know that they're less likely to meet physical activity guidelines than non-white, uh, non-Hispanic whites and non-Hispanic black adults. And we know that there's oftentimes language barriers. Many people who come over the border just simply don't speak English. And a lot of our healthcare system is still English dominant. And finally, we know that there's a lot of issues that surround immigration. We'll touch on all these a little bit today. We also know one thing, and you learn this very quickly when you're doing research, it's very difficult to engage Mexican origin people in lifestyle interventions, which as Albert pointed out, I'm a person that does diabetes prevention stuff, have for a long time, and I have a great love of lifestyle interventions designed to reduce the risk factor of obesity. But it's very, very difficult to get Latinx people engaged in lifestyle interventions. And we'll come back around to that. So let's talk about food insecurity. One in four Latino households are considered to be food insecure. And that's in comparison to 11% of white households. And in Arizona where I'm at, and I'm 60 miles north of the Mexican border, I'm in a very rural kind of area. Tucson is the city, it's about a million people. And you get outside of Tucson and you're in the middle of nothing. I mean, there's very small towns uh, or villages even. Uh, tremendous distances that have to be overcome. 
and finding food and getting food uh, is difficult. Many, many places where people live, particularly of Latinx heritage, do not have major grocery stores or food uh, access points uh, like most of us are, are used to. We also know that low-income Latino families spend about one-third of their income on food. And much of the food purchased is very calorie-dense, it's low in fiber, and high in fat, sodium, and carbohydrates. We know that 23% of Latino families in Tucson live below the poverty line, okay? And one of the things about the, the food access, which I was just reflecting on, I came here to Indianapolis uh, for another social event, and I drove through a McDonald's because I was starving and I was driving up to Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's 108 miles from Indianapolis. I needed something to eat. So I saw a McDonald's and thought, okay, I can get a quarter pounder and that will keep me tied it over until I you know, get established where I'm gonna go. And they were selling two Big Macs for five bucks. And I couldn't help thinking if that's a national campaign, that's gonna be really heavily hit upon by the Latinx populations that I deal with in, in Tucson because it's cheap and it's available. And so this is a, an issue that we face all the time that you know, a lot of times it's the cost of, of, of caloric intake, this, the, the barrier more than it is what the substance is. And when you start getting fast food that allows people to get like two Big Macs for five bucks, that's pretty effective when you have a family of six, seven people and you need to feed everybody and you're below the poverty line. We also know that Latino neighborhoods have one third the number of super, supermarkets as non-Latino neighborhoods. So many, many Latino neighborhoods, there is no easily accessed supermarket. They have local corner stores. Many of them are buying things at the 7-Eleven in places that just don't stock fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, quality produce, even dairy products. So it becomes very, very difficult. So food insecurity is a major barrier as we consider trying to do uh, interventions that regulate food intake that leads itself to obesity, which is the primary risk factor uh, for type 2 diabetes. Now, we also know that obesity amongst Latinos in the U.S. is extremely high. And in 2015, obesity in the Hispanic population was 43% of the population, which is higher than any other racial group that we deal with in the United States. And we know that Hispanic men have the highest prevalence of overweight and obesity. Nearly 40% of Hispanic men are classified as obese, BMI of greater than 30. And we also know that Hispanic males have the highest prevalence of obesity-related comorbidities compared to other racial or ethnic groups. And in fact, Last year, Mexico was evaluated as the most obese country in the world. Nobody beat us. We, the U.S. used to hold that record. You know, we were always so proud of that, right? But in Mexico now, it's, it's, it's a rampant epidemic. Obesity is, is extremely high now. And as you all know, obesity is a hallmark risk factor for the development of type 2 diabetes. Now, we made a decision in my center to focus on Hispanic men. And there's a lot of reasons for that. First, you rarely see them in the literature or in research looking at prevention programs. In a, rec a recent systematic review, it determined that Hispanic males represented only 4% of the total participants enrolled in 27 behavioral weight loss interventions covered by this article. So that's a very low percentage. And it's a very, it's, it's a, a large number of people, right? So people are struggling with how do we get Hispanic men engaged in th these activities and to these types of interventions and to research that can help address this problem. So we have a very high rate of obesity, but very, very low participation. We also know that there's a paucity of gender and culturally sensitive weight loss interventions. So the exclusion of Hispanic males in these studies is with other racial ethnic groups, and it's not specific to Hispanic males. You rarely see interventions that were de designed specifically to address the social, ecological, and cultural factors that influence Hispanic uh, behaviors and Hispanic decisions about dietary behavior and other such things. So we think that there's a need to examine Hispanic males' perspective of health behaviors related to weight management 
to develop and implement a gender and culturally sensitive weight loss intervention for Hispanic men. And this is something that uh, my colleagues in my center have been uh, dealing with now for the last couple of years. So I'm gonna tell you sort of how we approach this. We came up with a, a program called Animo. Animo is difficult to translate into English. It sort of means soul, but it's sort of a, it's sort of like a spirit thing. When you're saying, you know, animo at, at the ball game, it's like, you know, rise up, you know, uh, get your spirit into the game. It's sort of a, con it's a concept. And we used animo to, to establish a, a basis for research to try to determine if Hispanic men would be willing to participate in a gender and culturally sensitive weight loss study. At this point in time, this was two years ago, we couldn't really find too many examples of studies that were in fact designed specifically for Mexican origin men. And we wanted to know what health factors, diet and physical activity behaviors and intervention strategies would be the most appropriate for this population. How can we get them to play? This was summarized in a paper by two of my colleagues, David Garcia and Luis Valdez. Uh, in, uh, in perspectives and health behaviors related to weight management in the American Journal of Men's Health, uh, about Hispanic males' perspectives of health behaviors related to weight management. I urge you to read it. It's an enlightening uh, piece of work. What we did is first we tried to come up with different methods to recruit. We did flyer postings in community-based organizations. We went to facilities that uh, Mexican men tended to gravitate to. We went to local gathering places. There's a lot of uh, segregation in social gathering places in Tucson, where 44% of the population is Mexican, but the other 60% you know, plus is not. And of course, we went to healthcare clinics. Although healthcare clinics are somewhat labile because not a lot of people routinely seek out care in clinical settings. In fact, the use of emergency room facilities for primary care is ubiquitous in our, in our region. We also try to get uh, participant eligibility and we were trying to get people that had a weight factor. So we were looking for BMIs above 28 uh, and we wanted to make sure that they would qualify for a study where weight loss was appropriate. And we did this by initial telephone screening. And we'll talk about telephones a little bit more in a bit. So we wanted Hispanic males in Tucson, Arizona. And again, Tucson 60 miles from the border. So for all intents and purposes, we are a border town. There are true border towns right on the border, but they're very small. And when people cross over, they tend to go to Tucson before they make decisions about where they're gonna migrate from that point. We wanted people over 25. We wanted English and Spanish speaking if possible because some of the tools we were gonna use in fact had not been converted into culturally appropriate instruments. And we wanted them between the uh, ages of 18 and 64 years of age. In doing a lot of qualitative work, we basically did focus groups and structured interviews. We fought, saw that there were four overarching themes that we identified that led themselves to believe that we could use them to help increase the engagement of people in lifestyle interventions. First, we looked at general health beliefs about how diet and physical activity behaviors affected health outcomes. Surprisingly, a lot of Mexican origin men, and particularly uh, more recent uh, immigrants across the border, don't really have a strong understanding about this relationship. We wanted to talk about barriers to healthy eating and physical activity. What are the things that cause them to have issues in getting better diets? We've already talked about food insecurity and food access, but there are others. Some of it has to do with culture and what is considered appropriate diets, are diets that are associated with special events and, and, and special uh, family uh, issues. We also know that physical activity is a very tricky thing because many of the men that we have interviewed and done this work with have fairly physical jobs. Many of them are, are, are uh, farm mig uh, migratory folks and, and working in farm areas. Many of them are taking the jobs that we all see all the time. They're roofers, they're doing drywall hanging, they're doing uh, stuff with uh, gardening and, and, and activity like that. So it's difficult, even when they're grossly overweight, to try to convince them that they need to do additional physical activity on top of what might be considered their baseline. 
We wanted to know what were motivators for change. What would be the things that would cause them to think, I need to do something. I need to approach this problem, otherwise I'm gonna have a bad outcome. And we also found that there were viable recruitment and intervention approaches that we could capitalize on that were basically culturally defined more than they were physically defined. After we sort of got some of this information and got some perspectives about the things that would motivate them and cause them to think about ways that they might address the problem, we established a program to support research through a community service and partnering with underserved Tucson residents. We went after them and we didn't go after the people that were middle or upper middle class, even though they could be of Mexican origin. We went after the people that were much uh, lower in the economic scale and mostly were uh, relatively new residents to the United States. We built a program called Nosotros, uh, Comprometidos, uh, a Salud, uh, we're in this together sort of thing. Uh, we're we're gonna uh, attack this. And you notice that we have a family in there and you'll see why in just a second. So we decided to evaluate content messaging recruitment strategies to engage Hispanic males in weight loss research. We realized that we couldn't go any farther unless we had a way to reach out to men in particular and say, hey, look, you really need to do this. You need to participate in this. If you don't do this, you have an increased health risk, which there is familiarity with the negative sides of diabetes. There's a lot of diabetes in the Mexican culture, a lot of diabetes in the Mexican population, and they have a lot of personal exposure to this. They are aware of the dark side of diabetes. And so we completed qualitative research with Spanish-speaking Hispanic males to inform the development of a gender weight loss intervention. What would it get you to participate and what would the content of the intervention have to be to convince you to adopt new less risky behaviors now why am i showing you this picture uh, this is a favorite spot that we recruited this is the tango verde swap meet it is in the southern uh, vector of tucson arizona and what you're seeing here is a swap meet done mexican style this is not a swap meet like I grew up with, where everybody brought their car, opened up their trunk, put out a blanket and sold stuff. This is a, a semi-permanent structured setup. You can see the permanent structures and buildings. And it's only open on Friday and Saturday nights. And it is a mecca for people to go out and socialize and to party and to secure a variety of goods, many of which are familiar to them from Mexico, but not readily available in the United States. So up in the upper corner there, you see the cars. There are people with cars that are selling things out of their cars, certainly, but there's a lot of stuff going on. And you can buy anything at the Tango Verde Swap Me. You can get life insurance there. You can buy mattresses. You, you can get furniture. You can get haircuts. There's music going on. And as you can see in the lower uh, right-hand corner, you see that the, there's a lot of sweets uh, uh, and a lot of uh, chips and that kind of thing, which are ingrained into the Mexican culture. They have a very specific history of dietary intake of things that we don't see as much of, but they gravitate to this towards quite a bit. There's an example in the upper corner there of things that are just not available in the United States. So this is a very, very popular place. And while people all speak English there, it is largely Spanish speaking and a very rich environment to go out and recruit people. And that's exactly what we did. We set up our own booth for public health. And you see that there are signs here, both in English and in Spanish. And we offered screening to look at whether they had A1C levels using point of care uh, technology that was above uh, what we would think uh, it should be and indicating uh, prediabetes. And people in Mexican culture that are very poor are very fond of free screening. It's a way for them to learn about their health, which they are interested in, but they don't have the money to spend to go out and get any kind of routine medical checkups. So we did a bunch of stuff, blood pressure checks and, and cholesterol checks and A1C checks using uh, point of care technology. And it was very, very popular. And once we found risk factors, we were able to talk to them in whichever language they preferred uh, to think about ideas that they could engage uh, in with us 
as the providers of interventions that were designed to address their issues and not just general issues. One of the things we found in our focus group work is that fear and knowledge about things to reduce that fear was really important that people had a distinctive reporting of fear because they had the same experience as so many people have. They watched their mother or their father, their sister, their brother just rot away from diabetes. They were familiar with amputations. They were familiar with blindness. They were familiar with a lot of problems that go along with poorly controlled diabetes. And in the dark at night, every one of them would say, I don't want to go that way. They just weren't sure how to change it but they knew that that was an important thing. And we used to help belief model to build a communication. So what you can see on the side is we're saying things like, you know, heart disease is part of this problem of obesity and your liver could go bad. And there's a lot of liver disease in Mexican culture. You know, cancer is not unknown for obesity and having trouble with your knees and things in your back, things that go along with the consequences of being overweight that they're familiar with, but they didn't have a clear sense of how to address them. We also appeal to a cultural norm of, of the head of household perception. That, you know, if you're the head of household, you're responsible in Mexican culture for your family. And that's a strongly ingrained cultural perspective. That you really need to think about what you do is important to taking care of your family and you're the head of the household this is your responsibility so positive masculinity also called machismo right is this idea that you know a, a stand-up guy a real man takes care of his family and that may mean starting to do things to improve his health so he doesn't leave his family destitute and 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 you know without uh, support without any sort of way to to see their way through uh, and so real men take care of their families. But to take care of your family, first you have to take care of your health. And that was a message that we used and built upon, and it resonated quite strongly with the Mexican male population that we were going after. We also talked about spouse-centered and spousal convergence. And you see in this sign, in the English version, your husband could be carrying a whole lot more than just a few extra pounds. Help us help him. Mexican families are very strong. They're very integrated into sort of shared decision making to some extent. And women have a very strong role in encouraging their husbands to engage in behaviors that the husbands might think isn't masculine unless they have the support of their spouse. And we played to this and it was effective in us recruiting Mexican origin men. Finally, we wanted to assess the feasibility and acceptability and the preliminary efficacy of a gender and culture with, you know, weight loss intervention. And we wanted to do it with, with males between 18 and 64 over a 24 week period. So we piloted this combination of using focus group information to craft messaging, to craft what the intervention would say and why you should do different things. And we, we took it into play. So we asked them to attend a weekly in-person individual session guided by a trained bilingual Hispanic male lifestyle coach. Now, why do we use individual sessions? Mexican men, when you put them into groups, tend to fall back into a cultural norm of machismo, this idea of what a guy is, a stand-up guy is. And it, it becomes difficult for them to admit frailty or to admit factors that are difficult for them to deal with in front of other guys and other dudes, you know, you sort of would say, no, no, I've got this under control. I'm a strong guy. I got it okay. So we figured out after trying some piloting with group sessions that individual coaching, which is the approach that was used in the diabetes prevention program, really was a better approach to use cultural tailoring in this, in this group. We also tried to, to recommend a daily reduced calorie goal with specific focus on reducing or modifying the types of foods and liquids consumed. Now, the reason we focus in on liquids is we've discovered, and this is well known, that in Mexican culture, sugar-sweetened beverages is enormously popular, very cheap, and it's, it's highly used. 
When you go over into Mexican towns, you go across the border, you'll see little kids in strollers with bottles with nipples on it, drinking colored liquids. <laughs> you know, and I guarantee you, it's like a sugar poppy sort of thing. When you get a Coca-Cola in Mexico, it's actually much better than U.S. Cokes because they make it with cane sugar. I mean, it's, they just consume an enormous amount of sugar-sweetened beverages. And we really took that on as like, this is a place you can make a change. We also knew that there were different types of foods that were high fat, but high caloric. And we really focused more on, the, on reducing the intake of them than trying to substitute or eliminate them. Because we knew that substitution required some different decisions in economics that weren't always agreeable to Mexican origin populations. We also tried to get them to do 225 minutes of moderate physical uh, intensity uh, activity per week. We usually talked about walking and trying to walk with families and in groups. This is where trying to get the mothers and the wives of men into this deal was very effective. By getting them to encourage, let's go for a walk, honey, type thinking, they were much more likely to do it than if you say, we want you to start a new exercise uh, deal. We don't use exercise. We use physical activity. And that proved to be surprisingly more culturally adaptable to us than trying to get guys who've been working uh, as a migrant farm worker uh, to suddenly go to the gym or something like that. That just doesn't play very well. But walking seemed to be an agreeable thing, particularly if your family did it with you, because a stand-up guy takes his family for a walk. We also did some free gym membership, particularly for men that didn't have the, I'm already working my butt off, so I don't need to do this. And many of them would love to go to gyms. They said that to us in the focus group work. They just couldn't afford it. So we engineered free gym memberships to see if this would be effective. And we also uh, encourage optional spouse or significant other attendance at intervention sessions. Turns out that one of the most effective things we did was to get men to bring their sons to the gym. Stand up machismo activity, let me tell you, I'm gonna take my son and show him how to lift weights and show him how to do some of these things that a stand up good father should do. So what did we do? In three months, we got 50 men recruited and randomized. You can see their age here, their BMI, and 58% of them were Spanish speaking only. But 50 men in three months, we were very uh, pleased by that. That's a large number uh, compared to many studies that have taken much longer to try to do these types of things. 43% of them completed the 12 week assessment uh, that we were doing. That's about 80% of the population. And for the weight loss stuff, we got 92%. So we were very pleased by the uh, continuity that we had in the engagement levels. And what did we hit? At 12 weeks, there was an average weight loss of 6.3 kilograms, okay? And this shows you sort of what happened compared to the weight loss controls. People that we said, you have to wait to get into this, we'll catch you up to that. And in fact, it was maintained after 24 weeks. So we were very pleased by these results. They were very comparable to what we saw in the diabetes prevention program. Again, with a unique population that has historically been very difficult to engage. And so this sort of shows you uh, what happened with the diet. You see that the saturated fats, we were able to, to convince them to reduce the uh, daily caloric calories that were coming in from sources of saturated fat. Alcohol consumption went down. Uh, and we were pleased by that because alcohol consumption is very high in Mexican men and oftentimes leads to uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and other things. And we were happy about that. And we also knocked down the sugar sweetened beverages from four to seven uh, servings a week uh, to three servings a week. Couldn't eliminate them, but we could reduce them down. So you see that this sort of tailored culturally oriented intervention seemed to have efficacy and effectiveness. Okay, that's just to give you an idea of sort of the activities that we've been doing. We have gone way beyond that now, but I'm not going to continue with research. I want to spend what time I have left to talk about how can we reduce health disparity in Hispanic populations. And just give you some of the thinking that I've developed over my last four years in trying to do research in this unique population. I think, and this is more of the policy side of me, we need better accessible health care for Mexican origin and, and high disparity populations that are migrating into our country. We need to do things that are community-based versus central medical center-based. 
Mexican men, particularly in the Southwest, do not want to go to medical centers for a lot of reasons. They're hard to get to, they're more expensive, and they have immigration problems. If they are not documented, going to a medical center always has the threat or the perceived threat of being a place where you're gonna get turned into ICE and you're gonna be deported. And I think we need to vary the forms of healthcare delivery. Trying to do everything it, with, without having the benefit of, of the same language being used uh, is, is sort of a non-starter to me. I think we need to talk about how we deliver healthcare using different types of delivery vehicles, using community-based people that can help us span uh, these dimensions, using mobile units that are gonna go to the swap meet and other places like that. And we need to talk about payment structure. For those that do want to go to the higher quality, uh, more uh, high reputation medical centers like the medical school where I'm at, and we're the only medical school in the state of Arizona, so we're a large operation, we need to talk about how we charge them. A lot of people don't have insurance, and in Mexico, insurance is very unusual. So when they come over the border, a lot of times they're used to paying out of pocket and are willing to pay out of pocket. But if we sit, sit down and say, you now owe me three, four, five hundred dollars for a procedure or a set of tests or labs, it's a no-go. They may do it once, but they're not going to do it twice. We need to think creatively about how we get payment and how we can structure it over time so people can afford to get quality assessment and quality health care. This is a uh, slide that shows the percentage of adults 18 to 64 who are uninsured by race and Hispanic origin. And what you can see is that there's just not good insurance coverage. We are an insurance coverage based healthcare system in the United States. This is not gonna be effective as we deal with a rapidly growing population of people from the south, uh, you know, south of the border here. We need to think about this differently. I think we need to have culturally tailored education. And it goes beyond just simple translation. So often I see people say, oh, we have culturally adapted uh, materials or, or, or things to help with the education of our patients who speak Spanish. And what they've done is they've simply translated things that were geared towards a non-Hispanic culture. We need to consider cultural concepts when we're trying to engage Hispanics in health interventions. Here's three of the ones that I'm very fond with, machismo are this adherence to a, a, a Hispanic male-bound hyper-masculinity uh, uh, cognition. It's representative behaviors that can include power-seeking, aggressiveness, dominance, competition, and emotional disconnectedness. And if you don't account for these, you're gonna miss the boat when you're telling men that you need to do this, you need to do that. If you don't think about machismo as a cultural construct, you're gonna have some trouble and they're not gonna really pay much attention to you in my experience. Uh, familismo, which is the perceived obligation for helping family members, reliance on support from family, and the use of family as a behavioral and attitudinal referent. You need to integrate families into health decisions. And it's, it's so much more effective. We found it wildly productive in the study I showed you, the pilot study, where we got wives and children involved with the men it was much more likely that they would engage in these behaviors and not see it as, as non-machismo. They saw it as this is an important part of the family organization and structure. And then cavalerismo are used to describe behaviors that incorporate displays of honor, respect, dignity, social responsibility, care for your family, and emotional connectedness. This is a cultural moray in many, many Hispanic cultures, and particularly Mexican origins. And a lot of times where you see that, interestingly enough, for those of you that are physicians, is that Mexican people are probably much more likely to elevate your status because I have respect for the doctor. It's an important level of relationship and social interaction in Mexico. So you have the ability to capitalize on that but only if, in fact, you translate it into constructs that are familiar to Mexican culture and can be used to offset things that might say, I can't do that. A, a, a strong man doesn't do that. You know, we, you know, we have to account for these things if we're going to go forward and deliver more quality health care to Hispanic cultures. I think we need to increase culturally tailored education. And that is, for me, considering the location for delivery. 
We need to, you know, there's a history of relations with major medical centers with many racial uh, and ethnic uh, high disparity groups that is not really positive. I had this experience with African Americans in Indianapolis. And, and we, we need to think about where we do education. If we're gonna do it at the big medical center in a room that's difficult to get to and charges parking and all these other things, we are gonna miss some of the boats. But I think we need to sort of be thoughtful about moving things back into the communities where people are, are located. We need to deal with transportation issues. In my part of the country, a lot of Mexican families have one car and there are three people using it for four different jobs. So we need to think about things that could be a barrier. The bus systems where I live are marginal at best. So trying to have people take three buses to get to something, bad idea. We also need to think about rural living conditions. Again, in my part of the country, people live 40, 50 miles from the city. Okay, and to go someplace is a big deal. It's a big effort, it costs gas, it costs time, it needs the car, and during different times of the year, people won't do it. In the summer, it's 115 degrees outside, and if you think people are gonna stand at a bus stop or, or try to travel without air conditioning in their car for these things, you're out of luck. Same thing used to happen here in the winter uh, in Indianapolis. When it gets cold and crappy outside, people just don't come. We need to incorporate these things more systematically. We need to think about the time of delivery of education. And there are many barriers associated with job conflicts in the Hispanic culture. A lot of people are doing double jobs. It's not uncommon at all. So we need to think about things that can help us offset that. Evenings and weekends, for example, which are not routinely done in most health centers, is a good idea. And finally, we need to think about who provides the education. We can really capitalize on media sources, particularly telephones, high penetration of smartphones in, in the Mexican community. And we really need to take much more advantage of what we call promotoras, which are community health workers. Community health workers are, are people that, that come from their neighborhood, they're, they're familiar with, and they can be trained and be very effective at providing education. Just a couple things on media because I'm getting more and more into this. It's a great mechanism for education. You could do a lot of stuff that allows people to regulate their time. You can link it to personal health services for them so they can get information when they need it and when they perceive that they want it. And for many of the individuals that I deal with, the internet is already their primary source of health information, not necessarily always good. So if we build health sources that are on the internet with a, a friendly, culturally appropriate site, we have a much better shot at getting to them. We know that the implementation of internet-based uh, uh, factors allows individuals to get their intervention at the time most convenient for them. We've just done a study where we've looked at when are people doing these things? When do they get online and seek information or downloads that we've asked them to engage in? It's pretty much nights and weekends. Yeah, not always weekends, but oftentimes at night and frequently late. Oftentimes for men, they want to do these things when the rest of the family's asleep. Surprise, surprise. We also know that we can uh, personalize uh, media interventions and based on participant data and we can use engaging uh, formats based on interactive tools and graphically rich content. When we used uh, internet uh, content that talked about the swap meet and the fact that we're gonna have a mobile unit there and it's gonna be doing screening, we quadrupled our screening rates almost overnight. Finally, it's a low cost and rapid transmission through the wide community. It's an easy way to get a lot of information out very quickly. I'm a big fan and I encourage you to explore it. Finally, promotoras. These are your neighbors, your moms, your dads, your children, your youth, the members of your community who believe in helping and including others to be part of the solution to create healthier places for all. And there is a wildly large group of people that fill this role. It is something that is part of the culture to sort of be part of your community. And if you are seen as a person that's been trained and educated to help other people, to do uh, things that, you know, deal with your care or deal with your education. That's a stand-up job and a lot of people are respected and fall into the, the category of somebody that should be paid attention to. So they don't target the community, they join with the neighbors to create relationships built on trust. And as a result, 
They do more than learn about managing their diabetes. They start to deal with problems and issues and commonly perceived issues of barriers. It's a rewarding and rich thing. And if you have promethota access in your community and where you're working, I'm a big fan of taking control of that. So I've questions, concerns, issues, and you're probably wondering what the hell this slide is about. Those are called javelina. It's a variety of pig that is very common in Tucson. They're in my backyard eating leftover bird seed, and they come in big herds. Quite a wild thing that a boy from Indiana engaged while he was in Tucson. So that's what I have to share with you today. Happy to take any questions, any comments. Thank you, David. Um, and um, that was an amazing talk. And um, just a round of applause from everybody, please. Can we unmute people? <laughs> well, th this is mine. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, so we do have some questions from the audience um, and uh, about 10 minutes, so perfect number of questions. So from Sally Arif, uh, she asks, with regards to who provides education, what are the best practices when training your educators? Um, and then can we leverage our students and healthcare programs to be part of community interventions, I, I assume as promotoras? Yeah, uh, yes and yes. Definitely you can engage students. Um, you have to think about what you're educating on, okay? So if you're gonna educate on things that are sort of sensitive or maybe dealing with, with personal issues, sometimes the same age, uh, age person is a better deal. Uh, there's more receptivity to that, more perception about congruence. So if I got a 20-year-old a, a young female talking about postpartum issues with an, uh, an older woman, a lot of times those things don't work out so well. It's like, what do you know about this? You know what I mean? Yeah, you speak my language, but you don't have my experience. So I'm a big fan of trying to match people. Hi, Dr. Marrero, I think you- Dr. Became... Marrero, are you- yes. um, <laughs> I, I clicked a button, I think, uh, accidentally. Okay, can you hear me Sorry. now? Sorry, Sorry, David, I'm not gonna touch any more buttons. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, I'll bifurcate this as quickly as I can. I'm a big fan of trying to match people with the same sort of gender and age category because their perception by the, the client of, of understanding and, and experience with whatever you're trying to educate them with usually is enhanced. Uh, but you could certainly use students when you give them the, um, the cloak of, of training. When you sort of convince the, the client, hey, this person's been trained to show you how to do this, or how to use this technology, or how to test your glucose or whatever. Or this person's been trained to help you make decisions about your diet and how that can best work for you and your family. Um, trying to talk about uh, issues across gender is pretty tricky in Hispanic culture, particularly with men. If you want to talk about impotence, for example, don't send a woman. And, and it's not that I don't believe women are perfectly capable of this. It's not going to play well within that cultural framework. Great, 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 great. So there's gender and age matching that can um, be part of this. And students can certainly be trained to do this. Yeah. Uh, from David Ennis, um, has anyone used professional advertising agencies specialized in marketing to Hispanic populations to help change attitudes that are harmful to health? They have, they have, and I've seen some really good work that way. The trick with that for me is that all Hispanic populations are not the same and they have different cultural elements that sort of figured strongly into their social actions and, and their behavioral choices. So if you, take an advertising agency, you got to make sure that they are familiar with Mexican origin, or Costa Ricans, or Central Americans, or, you know, different groups. Cuban Americans, I'm a Cuban American myself, right? Cuban Americans have a different kind of way they think about stuff, even though we all speak a similar language. It's not the same, you know, but it's very similar. We all speak Spanish. So it's sort of like, you know, be careful about that. Doesn't mean they can't do it or they don't get it. Just make sure that you enforce upon them. This is the target audience. I'm dealing with this group, you know, and that will, you'll do much better if you do that. Great. 
Um, I actually have a personal, I mean, a, a, my own question about this. You mentioned machismo, fam familismo, and pacabalismo. Are those themes shared across the different uh, Latinx subgroups? Now, or are, they, are those slightly different? They can vary a little bit depending upon the, 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 the part of the, the Hispanic world you're coming from. They're sort of similar. You're going to see things like that. But for example, in Mexico, machismo is really strong. You know, it's a big deal. And when we get people from Central America, it seems to be less so. It's not like wildly less so, but it's less so enough that I'm going to play it a little differently. I'm going to use that card in my deck a little bit differently, you know? That's amazing. Um, from Wen Wan, we have a question about the control group in the randomized control trial. Um, this, how did you engage them? What, what did you actually do with the controls? With controls, we gave them some materials that they could look at that were, you know, highly structured for their community about things they could start to do to help them lose weight and to attack this. And we were very strong about telling them we have limited resource to pilot test this thing. We want you to wait. So we waited for the first 12 weeks before we started to fold them into, into the, the intervention. We, we, we were just upfront about it. This is how it is. And you're going to get a better model of this because we'll have some experience and we'll tune it up. You know, we, they like that idea. The idea, oh, so we get the better version. Yeah. You get uh, so a delayed intervention. Yeah. Um, got it. Uh, from Elvia, do you know when men in these studies become diagnosed with diabetes? Is it prior to immigrating to the U.S. or after they arrive here? I guess, how does the immigration process affect their diagnosis with diabetes? Well, are, many of you are probably familiar with something called the Hispanic paradox. The fact that many Hispanics seem to do better in health outcomes uh, than you would anticipate based on their their physiology and their genetics, uh, being Hispanic, which gives them higher risk for things like diabetes. But um, there seems to be a clear association with length of time in the United States for developing different conditions. And we don't know whether that's because there's a difference in screening and, and ability to find out information, uh, because they may not do it as much in the Mexican side of, 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 of the area. But we also know that it has something to do with the dietary changes. There's a lot more fast food options for a lot of Mexican immigrants than there is in Mexico. They have fast food, but it's different. Uh, and, and while they have McDonald's, there's more places that are more Hispanic foods, you know, more Mexican foods. So a lot of people in Mexico now, though, because the obesity has gone up so steeply in the last three years, are being diagnosed with diabetes in, in, over the border. We're seeing a lot more of it. Same thing with COVID. With COVID, oh my God, there were villages that I was doing work in that disappeared. They just disappeared. Because either everybody got COVID, and I don't know how many of them died, you know, or they left and went back to other family units that were in different locations. So people got really, really sick. And family uh, integration and family support is very enriched in Mexican culture. So a lot of people suddenly left where they were, you know, a small family that moved to, you know, you know, El Dorado or something, and boom, they went back to their more nuclear family. Now, of course, you can imagine what that was doing for the spread of COVID, but it was highly surprising to me to go to places that were literally deserted, you know, literally just gone. Small town of 10,000 people, and there was maybe three or four families left, you know, freaky, freaky, and, and very distressing to me. Mm. Uh, that's actually related to a question from Alex Knitter. Um, your outreach uh, at the uh, at the um, at the marketplace. Have you had to change your procedures because of COVID nineteen? What are your plans going forward and in, in doing this kind of outreach from your center? <laughs> it's a tough question for me in many ways. Um, all the research that I was funded to do by the NIH was group-based models of diabetes or NAFLD prevention. I had to stop it, <laughs> just stop it. You know, they said, you have to stop now. Never had a series of research projects that were stopped in the middle, you know, and there's no way to go back and redo them sort of thing. So that's, that's been a heartbreak for me. Yeah, we, we can't go to the swap meet and do what we did before. And the swap meet for a while was pretty much deserted, right? When, when the first scare came out. And, and I, I don't want to underestimate the power of fear in, in Mexican origin 
thinking that because uh, you have a culture that saw a lot of downsides to serious diseases, bad liver disease for alcoholism, bad diabetes diseases that have come out and people just getting hammered and they're fearful of that. So they're motivated to respond to that fear. Normally fear is not a good message strategy, right? But it sort of works here. And so when the swap meet, when COVID got really serious in, in Arizona, and we were a hot spot, as you probably knew, uh, it, the, the markets were, were deserted. But then everybody started migrating back, wearing masks and doing different things. But it's way below where it was. But I don't send my people there because I don't want exposure. You know what I mean? It's sort of a dumb idea. So we're doing different things, mostly through community centers and churches where we can regulate social interaction and distancing and things much more effectively. The swap means like a free for all. And there's thousands of people there on a Friday night, thousands. You know what I mean? It's just a huge deal. Right, right, right. Too bad. Uh, they sound like a lot of fun. It is um, big time fun. Yeah. Um, from Janice Benson, um, you know, uh, she asks about healthy fruit, vegetables and fruits, which is actually part of many of these cultures. That's actually a normal part of the diet. Um, but um, so Janice writes that um, when she first started working in South Lawndale in the early 1980s, there were actually a, a lot of fruiteras um, and uh, with many fruits and vegetables, but somehow that's become harder uh, to gain access to. Uh, re how, do we, how do we change that? Well, it's funny she mentions that what happened there from my point of view and, and colleagues of mine is about 10 years ago, the crops that were grown on the border got changed. There were different crops that were focused upon and many of them were carbohydrates, starchy kinds of things. And they grow, you know, so much stuff is grown on the border, you know, that, that comes in the United States, other than lettuce and a few other things, fruits and vegetables became much less, uh, much less production because it was less economically uh, viable. So we've seen big changes in the diet and the access to things simply because of farming practices getting whacked. Um, so, you know, you can try to encourage them to grow fruits and vegetables. And we do that in Arizona because we can grow citrus and things in your yard. You know, it's, it's very common, but it's, it's sort of an historical artifact. And when you go to Tayuma, which is an enormous farming community that's uh, west of me a little bit, it's right on the border, you know, they're growing, you know, wheat and corn and tobacco and beans and stuff like that. And they're not growing big populations of fruits and as many vegetables as they used to. It's harder to get. And when you talk to the old timers there who've been picking in the fields for 20 years, they talk about that. And so people sometimes grow their own but if you work, you know, 10 hour days in a field working farms, the idea of going home and farming is just not as exciting, I think, you know? Right. Okay. So it's a lot, it sounds like a lot of economic change yeah, incentives yeah. Uh, for farming. Um, so I'll, I'll actually take the uh, moderators, uh, uh, it, um, I have the right to ask probably the, one of the latter questions. So you talked about how the, that we need to really think of alternative ways of reaching out to people, not just the traditional clinics and health systems. Um, but how do we incentivize the healthcare facilities to, I guess, adopt these alternative ways of reaching out to people? Um, do you think that some of the new alternative payment models might work? Yeah, I think that that's going to help. I think another way that you could possibly, this is something we just came up with. Uh, we're one big medical center and the medical center wants the business, right? But sort of what we realized was that trying to get the triaging ability up to speed was the part of the issue. So if I go out and I do screenings and, and comprehensive assessments, I will uncover people that have serious diseases that really need more advanced care than they're going to get uh, uh, in a, in a um, in a community healer or something like that, that I, I need to try to convince them that your life is more dependent now on doing something differently. And so if I use a model where I do a lot of freebie screening, I have the ability to do more prevention, keeping them from the emergency room, because that's a big problem for us. Tons of people show up to the emergency room for primary care and we have to take them, you know, that's sort of the deal. We have to absorb that cost and it's very expensive. So we've been playing to that, model in the health center. Also the idea that we can find people, for example, we have um, uh, fiber scans in our mobile units, right? We can screen for NAFLD, 
But if we see something that looks like cirrhosis or something more difficult, we have to then try to convince this individual that you need to go to a place that is going to give you more advanced assessment, more advanced care. And there are units in Tucson that actually do clinical studies quite a bit. And you can get them into healthcare where they can actually access that. We're doing more stuff along those lines because it, it's a crime to not deal with that. So we're sort of using a model of let's be easier access for screening and assessment and then more structured about how we do triage into more advanced levels of care. And then we can work with them on Medicaid access and yeah. stuff like that. Great. So it sounds like you're having some success with health center leadership in, in yeah. persuading them of maybe moving in this direction to, to find complex patients. They did a, uh, an assessment of the emergency uh, room utilization last year, and it was breathtaking. Wow. Breathtaking. Nobody had ever sort of sat down and did the numbers, really worked on it. You know, I said, okay, let's look at this. And I'm talking about simple stuff. You, got, you have a sniffle or a cold or your kid's got a toothache or something like that, and they're in the ER. You know what I mean? Because yeah. they're afraid, they're afraid of, of the healthcare system. So you could modify that. So we could park a mobile unit at the swap meet and get 300, 400 people going through that thing in an evening. Right, right, right. Wonderful. Well, David, uh, we're at the end of the hour. We've um, had an amazing interaction, you know, uh, amazing talk and amazing set of questions. And, uh, and uh, we really appreciate what you're doing there. It's, um, an important population and you're doing some really innovative and important reaching important populations that that are that are hard to reach so i wanted to thank you all um, for attending um and thank you david most of all for uh for being our keynote speaker no i thank you all for listening i appreciate that and i hope you all have uh, good experiences with anything that you could take away from this talk absolutely thank you Bye-bye, y'all. Bye, everybody.